comedian. Um, and we're live again. Yeah. This oh, is yeah. Jersey Hobby Hour. I'm Steve Chin, your host. I am joined by Alan Wan. How you doing, Alan? Hey, guys. I found a really long piece of hair in my bag of chips. I don't know where that came from. And I'm also joined by special guest Sean Astrum. How you doing? <laughs> What's going on, guys? Sorry about those technical difficulties. <laughs> and Alan, I don't know where that hair came from. <laughs> yeah, th this is a this is a uh, little bit of a disturbing start because we had some technical difficulties today, and uh, we're starting a little bit late again, of course, uh, mainly because of those tech difficulties. Uh, my audio was cutting out in the last feed, so I had to relaunch uh, the stream and provide a new link to everyone. Uh, Hear but me now. Jersey Hobby Hour is a web show where me and my friends talk about current events, gaming, news, uh, entertainment. Uh, anything that really catches our fancy, and we're going to jump right into it. Uh, Alan, I want you to take it away again with the first topic, uh, since now we don't have any of those tech difficulties. Yep, uh, let's hope let's hope for the best. Uh, so, uh, a couple of weeks ago, J.J. Abrams and Disney released a what you call it, a trailer on Monday Night Football, and they said that would be the only trailer. However, they released an international trailer, actually, a, I think a Japanese trailer, and it's it's completely different, and they have, um, right now, they've been having TV spots out as well. So there's a lot of new footage that's out there, and it's kind of um, basically giving us a better point of, better perspective in terms of what the story is and how, you know, what, the unif what this galaxy is after 30 years after Return of the Jedi. So there's a lot of new footage. There's a lot of a lot of new things out there. So my question is um, to Sean: uh, What are your thoughts of the new footage? And do you think this like this um, is there too much content that's coming out right now that might spoil the movie for uh, moviegoers? Honestly, I think people were waiting so long for this again. Uh, the content that was given to us is not really spoiling anything. Um, in fact, it's probably getting more users, uh, uh, more of an audience that wouldn't have watched it before. I think. You know, uh, if you think about how they did marketing for episodes four, five, and six, I think they're kind of taking like the Disney approach with this. Um, you know, it's, it's it's I think it's working. I think it's not too much though. Uh, yeah, because apparently I think it seems like everything that we see right now it's apparently like the first third of the movie or the first half of the movie where we we haven't even seen where Luke is. So that's my other question. Like, where do you think where do you think Luke stands in here right now? So, I, I mean, I think that there's a, a lot of things to be said about the marketing campaigns for uh, games or movies these days. A lot of times they're almost misleading in the way that they're cut together. Because if you have the same production footage from one movie and you give it to two different editors, you could end up with two completely different movies. So, like, in terms of, like, the way that I feel about the trailers, ultimately I don't think it's going to matter because the movie's going to be a completely different beast. Uh, but at the same time... Uh, I don't feel like they're giving away anything towards the primary components of the story, at least. And I don't think this footage that we're seeing, there's really not a whole lot of new footage. It's really just a bunch of small clips that they've just sort of extended out a little bit more, and now we're getting to learn you know, names and things like that officially through the trailers. I, I don't think it's really spoiling anything. Yeah, I think they're they're they kind of like hammered us with um, I think either an international trailer where he's um, they have the girl the main girl, which is Ray, Ray. Uh, everyone thinks that she's apparently a, a Skywalker, so it seems like you know she, it's kind. Of, this is kind of beating her over the head, like, hey, she's gonna be a Skywalker because she's apparently in the desert and she's waiting for her family. Similar to like how Luke and um and Anakin was and Tatooine. You know, I I didn't watch or uh, read any of the books, uh, rather, uh, but I'm not sure. It, is this really identical? to the way uh, the first episode one opened up? Um, well, first of all, the books that came out um, is right now no longer considered canon. You know, the ones back in the, back in the day um, before Disney bought the Star Wars, those are not considered canon anymore. Those are considered Star Wars Legends or Legacy or whatever. So they're not considered canon. So anything from there, they're not going to rely on that. However, it doesn't mean they can't borrow elements from there to make char new characters so, like, um, Luke's wife in, in Legends or Legacy, uh, her name is Mara Jade. So they might have a, some sort of character like her that appear in the Star Wars canon right now. 
So, so uh, a, a, a lot of the uh, imagery that you're getting from the uh, trailers that you see right now is very similar to A New Hope. Like, the very uh, desert sort of background that Tatooine was. You're, you're getting a lot of that. Uh, and right. it's, it's very ever-present right now. So, I mean, they're definitely harkening back to that sort of original 1970s Star Wars and, like, the epicness of space, but this, you know, desolation and, and loneliness of the desert. Um, I, I'm I'm seeing that kind of theme a little bit. I, I don't know if, like, a lot of the cinematography and everything is the same because, I mean, I think you really need to see the movie in order to get a better feel for that than oh, yeah. just watching the edits. But uh, I, I definitely see that's the case, uh, that, that they're definitely hearkening back to the original... Uh, Episodes 4, 5, and 6. Yeah, and that's kind of what I was thinking about. When they're going back to that original style, they're going to get like all these original people, all the old fans, the true hardcore fans, they're going to get them really excited about this. Like, wow, Disney's doing this right. You know? I'm well, not going to screw this one up. Well, not only are they getting the old fans, they're, getting a whole new, they're trying to get a whole new generation of fans. So what they're trying to do is that not only is Episode 7 supposed to be like, supposed to please, you know, the fan you know, fans that love the original trilogy, but also the fans who love the prequels. Because there are fans who like the prequels, no matter how terrible they are. Uh, but then they're also trying to get this new group of fans as well that are growing up, that are growing up with, like, uh, like Star Wars Rebels, like these kind of TV shows, and kind of bring them into the Star Wars universe. And for them, that is probably going to be their new hope to for them. So it's, it's like they're just bringing a whole new generation. So that's why this anticipation for this movie is going to be super huge, because... I mean, maybe I'm a little blinded because I'm a huge Star Wars fan, but the th I mean, it seems like you know they're they're really trying to they're really trying to you know market this to to every in diff to different generations. Yep. It's curious to say that I'm curious if they did the design of the new lightsaber with the the blades off the, the hilt. hilt. The hilt. If that was just that'd be a like a cool factor to the kids. I'm curious if that was their angle for that because it wasn't yeah, but, well received. Yeah, <laughs> but back to the marketing for that, they came on real strong and really early with that, and now yeah, it's oh. kind of like. It off into the background, and like everyone's like, forgotten. Uh, like uh, I, I, don't ignore this one. You don't. You didn't see this. No, I think he's. I mean, well, the character Kylo Ren, who's the one that's wielding that lightsaber, he's actually been very prominent in marketing. Like they've they've been plastering his face all over the place. Like if his you were face, kind of, but the lightsaber, not, his face, not really. Not the lightsaber. <laughs> well, yeah, but they also they have it for sale, and from what I saw, like I can't, I couldn't find it. Um, they they also, I mean, for them, they have these like was it like lightsaber builders. And target so basically you just build lightsabers. It you build it like ridiculously. You can have like five five like lightsabers uh, coming out. But you know, you know how kids like used to, and I'm sure they still do, play with flashlights and like use them as lightsabers and stuff. Like if you had to build one of those using flashlights, you'd have to duct tape three flashlights together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was taking us back we'll to, to the original uh, 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 topics, though. I mean. In terms of the, the two different trailers that's available internationally and, and here locally in the U.S. Uh, for TV, I honestly didn't see a huge difference in the way that they were trying to tell the story. It was very similar. Uh, I, I think that it's uh, it's really... I feel like they kept to the story as opposed to relying on the editing to, to tell the story, like, like I mentioned before. Yeah. As far as where Luke is, especially with all the marketing materials that's out there, and uh, especially since they made him very prominent in one of the earlier trailers, um, and not showing his face, though. Yeah, his uh, voice, though, his voice. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm really not sure, but my, my argument and like my, my thought is that He's become reclusive because he doesn't want to ha want to have to do anything with the force, and like this whole awakening thing is sort of a like, hey, you can't just walk away kind of thing. Other stuff's happening in the universe. That's that's what my take is. He's probably just a hermit, kind of like how uh, Ben Kenobi was in the first, uh, or really in in the fourth movie. Sean, what, what what do you think about that? Is is that kind of sound good to you, or is that like uh, just like eh? I mean, I've read a lot of the like the fan stuff about him being a Sith Lord, and then Jar Jar Binks being a Sith Lord. Uh, so yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's Jar Jar. Crazy. Jar. Yeah, Jar Jar. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, it, he didn't really want to get thrust into this Luke in the first place. You know, this was all forced onto him, and he didn't really enjoy the process. You know, throughout the movies. So for him to go into reclusion, it kind of makes sense to me. You know, I, I could. I could understand if that's the direction they went with, but, uh, but yeah, no, I'd, I'd rather see 
uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of impact from Luke. I'm really hoping for it. That he's very important to the to the movie. I think he's going to be a huge part of the movies going forward. I think we're going to basically see him for like like five ten minutes at the end of like episode seven, and then he's basically um, going to be end up training whoever the two Jedi, whoever they're going to want to train to be Jedi's in eight and nine, and he's going to take on that I think that Yoda role basically. Yoda, really? Yoda. So that's that's what I think. I don't think he's going to be a Sith because if he want, if he was going to be a Sith, he should have been a Sith with his father. So anyone that thinks he's going to Sith, you're an idiot. Sorry. But yeah, I, I'm I'm totally uh, like feeling the whole I'm not afraid and you will be like counter coming from Luke like at some yeah. point during this movie. Yeah, I mean it's just it's so like I don't know powerful statement and you know that made uh, the Empire Strikes Back and like I, I think it's a powerful statement even for like a new generation to learn that you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know just. <laughs> Something that something that really like grabs my attention. I agree. And something you never forget. Much like our next topic, which is about Finding Dory, a new movie based in the Finding but she Nemo always universe. Forgets. But she always forgets. <laughs> what you did there, we see it, Steve. Yeah, we see it, Steve. <laughs> uh, did, did you guys? I mean, Alan was the one who posted this, so I'm sure he watched the the video. Uh, Sean, did you get a chance to watch the trailer? I just watched it a few minutes ago. Um, honestly, I'm not sure uh, how they're going to go with this. Uh, it, from w- watching it just real quick, it's about Dory wanting to find uh, her family and starting to have uh, you know, regain some memory. And uh, I, spoiler. <laughs> parents, well, I mean, if you watch the the spoiler, I know, I'm trailer. kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I don't know. I don't know how much you know content you're going to get out of it. I mean, Finding Nemo, it, yeah, that that was a pretty good one. Now you're trying to find Dory's family. I'm not sure. I'm too sold on that story. I'm probably still gonna watch it because, uh, yeah, they they don't they never make a bad movie. Uh, I'd like to differ on that. Um, I I didn't like Finding Nemo to be honest with you. I didn't. I you know like everyone loved it. I I thought it was okay to be honest. It was all right. And Dory being an ancillary character, and then they're kind of drawing the focus to her. I don't know if that's gonna be good. Because like the, what they try to do with minions, where they try to bring minions to the forefront, that movie wasn't as good because they didn't have Gru in it. Because Gru was basically at the center, and then you would have the minions throw in this little flavor of them, you know, being cute and stuff. And then if you just have them, it kind of, you know, was, something was missing. So to me, I mean, you're gonna have Nemo and all and everything like that. The focus is gonna be on Dory, but I don't know how great it's gonna be. Um, to you, I. That uh, my question was that: Do you think this is going to be a good Pixar movie? Because Pixar did make some shitty movies. Have you seen Cars or Planes? So I, I haven't seen Cars or Planes, but uh, to to harken back to uh, the mention about the sort of side character movies, one thing that uh, I definitely see is uh, you have side characters like. Uh, let's say Chandler uh, from Friends, who makes a, a movie or a TV show. And, you know, he has his own separate TV show. Like, it, it doesn't it doesn't fly. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I just... Or Joey. I think Joey was one, too. No, oh, Joey no, yeah, had to... Right. Oh, it was Joey. It wasn't Chandler. Right. Matt LeBlanc. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm just... I, I, I don't uh, really see the... Um, emphasis that you can get out of a secondary character as you can a primary character uh, from an original series. Oh, it'd be like taking the uh, the T-Rex from uh, Toy Story and like pulling him out and giving him his own full movie. Like it, It's okay for a short, but I don't think it's worthwhile for a uh, at least for a uh, full length feature film like this is going to be. Oh, let's see. I mean, what are your guys like top like top off the top of your head like your top five Pixar movies? I mean, I know I'm sure you guys all seen Pixar movies. Like, what are your like out of the out of your uh, top five? Does that be in any order? <laughs> Sean searches for that. You <laughs> <laughs> hear see nothing. No, that's fine. Um, yeah, like, what do you th- what is what are yours, Steve? Or I can start. 
right, if you want, I'll start. Give us so, a start there. I'll start. So five. Eh. So five. Like, well, my favorite actually was um was Wally. I think Wally is my favorite Pixar movie right now. Um, it it was it was well done because all you had was this little this robot just make noises and you, and it killed. Uh, my second favorite is The Incredibles. That was kind of like starting the boom of like superheroes, and that was actually the one Pixar, Pixar movie that really deserves a sequel because you know it's set up to have a sequel, but then yeah, they have yeah, yeah. yeah it's, they're gonna have one, but in like 2018 or something like that. Um, next one is probably for me it's probably Inside Out, the new one that just came out. That one was really good. Um, uh, Toy Story and I think Toy Story three. Those are my my five. What about you, Sean? Well, I'd have to go Toy Story and put that number one. Mm-hmm. But uh, but I agree with the Inside Out being number two. Um, they really had a unique uh, outlook uh, on that whole psyche. And it was just an incredible movie. Well done, really. Uh, the twist, as an adult watching this, uh, it was a really good movie. Yeah. And any kid can relate to it as well. So. Uh, but uh, outside of Toy Story being an absolute classic, you know, in our childhood, you know, Excellent soundtrack and and just uh, the fact that you know you're playing with toys and they come to life, a childhood's dream. So mm-hmm. I didn't watch the other ones though, the child uh, Toy Story two or three, uh, so I couldn't say anything about them. I thought Wally was okay, but I would put Incredibles at number three. So mm-hmm. yeah, as far as mine goes, I, I'm I'm really uh, not sure because I haven't watched a lot of Pixar movies. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Toy Story is definitely like my favorite. I, I've seen Monsters Inc. Um, I, I haven't still actually. <laughs> I, 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 I think know, I, I, accident, <laughs> I accidentally downloaded that when I was trying to download like Attack of the Clones, like three times back when I was in when I was downloading off LimeWire. Sorry, I used to download off LimeWire, and it took like three days. <laughs> Sorry, <Okay>. Steve. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, like LimeWire or LimeWire, uh, cause, uh uh, Morpheus, like all mm-hmm. those things. Back yeah. Today. Oops. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. Uh, t- again, t- to be honest, I I don't think I have a top five just because I I just have not watched yeah. enough of Pixar movies to really yeah. warrant. Fair enough. I mean, it's not. I think they're. Tr- I mean, it is one of the few movies where they're trying to target kids, but then they has a has a deeper meaning for for adults. But then it's not for everybody because like I don't like I don't really like to watch that much cartoons or animated movies to be honest with you anymore. I mean, they are a phenomenal studio, and they put out a lot of great content. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, a lot of a studio that put, uh, puts out a lot of good content, uh, Activision Blizzard deci- finally decided to to basically start a production house now. So, uh, Steve, you want to talk about that? So, uh, I mean, Activision Blizzard is really a Big company, of course, because of World of Warcraft and and all of their properties are really big hits, except for some of the older stuff that popped up on like Super Nintendo and Sega. What are you talking um, about Double Dragon? You know, Lost Vikings, Blackthorn, <laughs> uh, Rock and Roll <laughs> Racing. <laughs> Uh, Plus, I mean, gr- gr- so great, great properties, but I mean, you know, they never took off and had you know big, big, big stories like Warcraft or Starcraft did. Um, I think one thing that caught everyone's attention with that gaming house, though, is the attention to detail and the quality of their uh, in-game cinematics. The, you know, the, the sort of scripted videos that you had to watch in between the missions. And those have always been a huge draw, at least in, in the Warcraft and StarCraft universe. And, and Black Ops, and Call of Duty, by the way. Call of Duty yeah, has always so, had I mean, that, that's This is a, a more recent thing where you have Activision that, you know, catches up with... Uh, you know, with Call of Duty and things like that. So, I mean, the, the really big sort of blockbuster hits in terms of, you know, game sales. But that, I mean, can that translate into movies? I don't know, but it's definitely worth a shot. I mean, it seems like the uh, the uh, production house that they've set up aside from the gaming stuff is really going to focus on uh, sort of TV and uh, more movies kind of, uh, kind of uh, properties. However, uh, I, I did take a note and see that, I mean, they are interested in making, like, video game sort of CG. So I mean, they might actually end up making the video content 
for other companies, other smaller companies or other even large companies that, that want that sort of cinematic experience. And I think that's where they'll probably get a lot more play than necessarily in TV or in, you know, in the movies. You mean, uh, well, like Final, you mean like Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within? <laughs> Just like how great that movie was? Let's forget about that one right there. <laughs> that never happened. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but yeah. And Sean, what do you what do you think about the the opening of that production house? I think it's uh, it's long overdue. It's coming at the time uh, which we'll discuss later about the esports scene, and you have the entertainment value of video games as a whole with the youth generation. You have your average gamer, you know, in the 30s. You know, all these are good target audiences for uh, like movies. Uh, I would like to see uh, a little bit more. Uh, I don't know selection, the type of games that they go within the storylines. Because you have you have all these, uh, you know, games that are based off of books, for the most part. Like, World of Warcraft has a lot of lore in, you know, several different books. And you can take every one of these books and adapt them to a film. So there's a lot of material that they can choose from, and uh, kind of interesting uh, to see where they go with this. Because we've seen this with uh, Tomb Raider, Laura Croft, and uh, you know, whole pop culture, you know, angle with that. And then we saw the boobs. failures. Yeah, boobs. And we saw the failure with, uh, uh, what was it? A Doom in Final Fantasy. Yeah. So uh, I think a lot hinges on the success of this Warcraft movie uh, that they're putting out. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know. We're going to have to see. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's, it's, I, mean I, I, I think I said this before. I think it's going to hinge a lot on Warcraft and the Assassin's Creed movie that are coming out in terms of whether they're going to have a renaissance of, um, of video game movies. Because, you know, there's like you said, there's a lot of, lot of good lore in these video games, and I think that that's going to be the next trend that's going to be coming up where, you know, it's, it was comic book movies, and then they're going to switch over to video game movies because of all that. Um, I think Activision's, they're first going to... I mean, Activision Blizzard, I think one of the things they're going to try to do is try to make a Call of Duty movie. I mean, did you see the sales that they reported for a Call of Duty Black Ops 3? It apparently, over within 72 hours, it made $550 million worldwide. That made more, that made more money than uh, Jurassic World did in, in the weekend. It is, it's ridiculous. I mean, I don't think any game has ever made that much money within, within that three-day that three period. So it seems like the the interest is still there, even though like to me, Call of Duty seems like a like a worn out record. It seems like it's just the same rehash every year. I mean, I I'm not a huge fan of it, but you can't deny the sales of it. So it would be crazy for Activision Blizzard to not want to have to set up this cinematic universe with Call of Duty in it. Now I, I'm I'm a little tempted to say that. Uh, I don't want to see a Call of Duty movie. It's, it's not a matter of if you don't. It's a matter of will they make money. That's not. That's not the question. I mean, I just for just from a personal opinion standpoint, like I, I don't really. I don't either. I don't. I, I don't know what what would set it apart from a lot of other war movies and things like that. The label. The label. It's like having the skins. I know, but that's just sadly how it is. Um, it's just going to be the label that oh, it's a Call of Duty movie. But then you really call it. Is there really a lawyer Call of Duty? Like I think I mean. Me and, in terms of level of success, I'm, I mean, I would definitely go see the movie. I mean, 100%. Yeah. But I just, I don't see just it Just cast being... a rock. Just cast a rock, that's all. <laughs> yeah, he, he'd probably make a, you know, a good player in in, in the game of that movie. Uh, oh, yeah, but... like, in, like in Doom? Like in Doom? <laughs> the best part was they broke the fourth wall, sort of, with the whole, I'm not supposed to die, like, line that he had in that movie. <laughs> really, really, really interesting that... Uh, that, that Activision went ahead and did this and just, you know, kind of made their own production house for this. I, I just don't... I, I don't see them uh, really having a good, strong foothold right now in, in the sort of movie market that there is. Uh, maybe on the live streaming, uh, not, or really video-on-demand streaming uh, that Netflix is or Hulu, you know, maybe they can get a, a series or a miniseries going on that. I mean, they've done it before where they've launched it on their own websites. Like, Assassin's Creed had, like, their own miniseries. Dragon Age had their own miniseries. Um, but I, I think something that's, like, serialized and, like, going to run for a number of seasons, I, I think that's uh, a little bit tougher to do, especially with a video game, because, I mean, it's just you don't want to ruin the gaming universe if you're coming up with something that's, you know, a fixed storyline that's, you know, a side... 
uh, from the actual games that you're going to play. Because that's like one thing that like really hurts games now too is being super linear. So I mean, if you have stories that are happening like right alongside your your video games, it's really tough to butt up against them. And it, and you're seeing this problem even in like the Marvel universe where you have multiple uh, continuous storylines that are running concurrently, and you, you're having a little trouble bumping into to the other guys. It's like you know they should be there. How come they're not? That that kind of stuff. Sean, I mean, how do you feel about uh, about Activision's sort of grand scheme of things uh, in terms of uh, movies and and games? But like I said, I think it's uh, it's long overdue with that. The uh, the content that you're saying with butting into different storylines, I think there's so much material in the different genres and the different types of games that are already massively popular and successful. I don't think they're going to have an issue. Uh, at least in the beginning, you know, with unique content. So, like, say they do Warcraft, which is not World of Warcraft. It's the Warcraft series that started all in the beginning, you know, when you had it's just the uh, real-time strategy Warcraft. Now, that's old. You know, that's, that's something untapped as far as the general, you know, user base of their current uh, video games, you know. So that's the direction that they went. They went as far back as they could, so they're not going to have this issue of running into, you know, content. And, you but know, I feel like you're also going to have those people who are real hardcore fans that are going to see the movie, and they're going to be like, well, that's not how it happened. Well, there uh, are always going to be hardcore fans like that, Steve. You just can't please them all, because it's more of the general public. I mean, those those hardcore fans are just so much of the population, as opposed to all the, the massive audience that's out there. You can't just please that small segment and kind of, you know, take away from, like, the, the huge group, the general audience. Well, uh, m- moving from uh, Activision Blizzard's sort of uh, takeover of the movie industry, uh, let's roll right into BlizzCon, which happened over the weekend, uh, and just hit some quick points on that and just quick reactions. Uh, what did you guys think about the trailer for the Warcraft movie? Me. I mean, we, we did talk a little bit about the teaser for it last week. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, but we got the full trailer on Friday, and I think it was spectacular. And I, I, I kind of want your take, just real well, quick. There's nothing short of Blizzard's, like, perfection in, like, in their cinematic cutscenes. And uh, it's, I'm really excited for this, actually. I am. Uh, they gave you just enough to think, oh, who's that character? I don't know. I'm really curious, you know, who these guys are. You know, that's... Uh, the one thing that I gotta say is I'm not so sure the actual live acting uh, humans that they have in it are gonna mesh well with the orc that you see there. But uh, they're we'll flashy. See. They're shiny. They're really shiny. <laughs> you can tell. Oh, what do you think, Alan? Oh, I'm not. I mean, I played a lot of World of War. I played World of Warcraft, but not as much as you guys. I don't know anything about the lore. I mean, I honestly just all I did was just level grind. I don't know well, anything that's going this on. Is not- this is not World of Warcraft. Oh, I, this is Warcraft. The, yeah, I know. You know. The real yeah, fashion. I know. I understand. It's like the the beginning where uh, beginning where the humans first come in contact with the orcs, and it looks. I mean, just looking at the trailer, it seems like it's kind of like um, reminds me something somewhat of like Avatar or something like that, where basically, um, you have like this, you have like this um, like these native people that are trying to invade into this area, um. It seems like both sides are not at fault, where both sides has their own... Um, no one's going to be painted as the villain. Like, the orcs aren't going to be painted as the villain in this one. You're going to sympathize with them, basically. You're not going to basically... There's no one clear-cut enemy. It's like Civil War, where, like, Iron Man is not going to be the bad guy, and Captain America is not going to be the bad guy, basically. But then, you know, they all have their both separate ideals, but and they have their own purpose, so then you can either root for one side or the other. So, um, for me, the trailer... Um, if I thought it was okay, I mean, I'm not a huge fan of it, so I I wish there was a little more of um little more uh little more action shots or a little more like money shots to kind of get me. I'm like, oh shit! Like I'd never had that sense. I mean, granted, I'm still gonna go out and watch this movie. However, you know, it just the trailer itself. Eh, I know everyone else said it's great, but I thought it was only only okay. Steve, uh, like I said, I, I think it was spectacular. Speaking of in development, uh, we actually have Mass Effect Andromeda. Uh, there was a trailer that came out on 11.7, um, wearing a Mass Effect hat for the SR2. Uh, so on, on 11.7, and the reason for that is N7, November 7th, uh, 
basically is an icon that they have in in the game for any of the the soldiers that are in like the special ops. Anyways, they came out with a new sort of teaser trailer for the new game, and it's basically the female version of Commander Shepard saying goodbye to the sort of universe that you had built in the first Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. Now, I know Alan's played through all of Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3. Uh, Sean, have you played any of the Mass Effect games at all, or read anything about them? I've watched a little bit of the gameplay uh, when uh, some of the roommates were playing, with, but no, I haven't watched or played it myself. So uh, th- there's a lot of speculation of what the story is going to look like because it's supposed to be completely aside and separate from the original storyline from the first three games, even though it's sort of world-breaking. Um, so I'm kind of curious to know like what what's going on and you know how they deal with the universe as it stands if you're going to have this sort of fourth sequel. And my guess is, and this is spoiler alert, uh, at the end of Mass Effect 3, Earth gets attacked. Most of the the species of the universe or the galaxy are in shambles. I think they send an arc out to another galaxy, to the Andromeda galaxy. And by an arc, I mean a giant ship full of all the different species and uh, like basically colony ships to just basically sleep their way into another galaxy. And no matter what happened in your Mass Effect 1, 2, or 3 games, that entire galaxy could be destroyed, but now you have this arc ship that arrives in Andromeda, and it's your job to explore. Uh, and the reason why I think that is you have the N7 tag that is so prominent in the trailers that I have to imagine that it's you, you have the same government. Uh, you know, it, it can't be too far in the future, too far in the past, because those things just didn't exist. Alan, what's your take on, on that belief? Uh, yeah, I agree, because obviously... Um, like mass, like any, like Mass Effect. There's a lot. You make a lot of different choices, and that affects. And obviously, you know, the last choice you make dramatically affects, you know, the galaxy overall. So they gotta find a way to kind of ret- to kind of, you know, let you have those um those decisions, while also give presenting you something that's brand new and unique for you to make new decisions. That you know, if you didn't, if you made a certain decision, you won't get impacted. It you know, in the, in the new game, basically. I mean, we I mean, we knew this was going to happen. I mean, spoiler, you know, obviously, you know, the Shepard's story ends at the end of Mass Effect 3, basically, right? You know, from what we see, his story ends. Um, a lot of colors change, you know, blue, green, red, different color changes. Um, but, you know, his story ends. Uh, his or her story ends. So, basically, they need to have a new character, and that's a w- great way for them to start fresh by, you know, sending them to a different galaxy and having them, you know, start start fresh and meet new races. And, um, yeah, start, start a new uh, journey. Sean, uh, in, in case you're interested, uh, the ending to Mass Effect 3 is, like, hotly, like, contested in terms of, like, whether or not it's canon and about how awful the original endings were. They actually came out with DLC, free DLC, to change the endings a little bit and kind of flesh out the story because people felt cheated by the ending. Uh, they felt like it was all the same, especially since all three endings essentially ended with the same uh, video, except the colors of the explosions were three different colors. <laughs> you should definitely check it out when you have a moment. Uh, I'll, I'll make sure to post the video uh, link down in the video description for other people to check out, too. Is it, it really is kind of... That's, mm, that's- that's an unprecedented in service to the person, I, the, the user base, the fan base. This is a big following. Of this I know, and <laughs> I did not know it was that bad. That's incredible. It, the, the ending was wow. not that good. <laughs> they dropped the ball that much. The, 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 the director's cut when they added the new DLC. They they finished up the story like they should have. I, I think it was partly because EA tried to rush it and get it out the door. Well, you yeah. just said the word right there, EA, of course. But with that being said, though, I think they were just trying to jump onto that formula. Which you see in a lot of video games have with the the choose your own you know the destiny right. your, your your decisions throughout the game are going to shape the way it ends and they just wanted to jump on that formula and they just didn't finish it like well said. so I, I think they actually the formula was one of the first few games that really took the whole your decisions affect N- gameplay Knights of the Old Republic I think I think I think that was the first one. Because it's made by Bioware. But, however, they didn't take those actions and move them into another game. Your, your actions still mattered for the story for the first one. I don't think they imported those decisions into the next game. I don't remember. The second game wasn't, wasn't so good, that's why. No. But, yeah, I mean, the, the character import thing was a big deal, and the whole storyline's changing. That, that was a huge deal because they hadn't really done that before. Or, I mean, no one really had. 
Mm-hmm. Now, speaking along the lines of the same type of gameplay, uh, something I, I really want to talk about, and we'll finish up with with this one, is Fallout 4. So, Fallout 4 came out yesterday, right alongside StarCraft. I picked it up when I picked up StarCraft. And you guys don't know anything about Fallout 4 at all? It's not even that we don't know. We don't care for it. It's uh, how big of a gamer group that we are, and we just haven't played it yet. Uh, well, I played the beginning of Fallout 3, because I, I got the game from Humble Bundle. So I had, so I tried it out, and I was like, eh. I mean, I think if I really sat down and played it, I would love it. But it's a matter of you have to sit. It's just like you know me having to sit down and watch Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, stuff like that. You know, you have to sit down and actually do it. But have, have either know. of you guys played Skyrim at all? I mean, a big pop culture hit now too in gaming. I did the same thing. I got it on a good deal on Steam, and I was like, all right, let me let me put some time into this and play it. And it's a fantastic game. Really enjoyed it. Yes. I, I could see... Oh, what's your reference to Skyrim with Fallout? Okay, so uh, Bethesda made Skyrim as well. So the, the, the whole source of all of this is really, uh, if you look all the way back, is a Elder Scrolls game um, by the name of Morrowind. I think it was Elder Scrolls 4? No, 3. Uh, it was a first-person RPG. They did a phenomenal job. It was available on Xbox. It was also available on PC. And they expanded that into Oblivion, which was Elder Scrolls 4. And then they also had Skyrim Elder Scrolls 5. But in between uh, Oblivion and Skyrim, you actually had Fallout 3 come out, which was the first time that you had a first-person shooter um, mixed with an RPG in that universe. Prior to uh, Fallout 3... Fallout was actually just like an isometric RPG, and by that I mean uh, very much in the style of Baldur's Gate or Diablo. You have this sort of top-down kind of bird's-eye view on a character that you're running around doing an RPG, you know, talking to people and sort of progressing your stats that way. It was by no means a first-person shooter. And that carryover from Fallout 2 to Fallout 3, using the same things that they learned from uh, Morrowind and from Oblivion, they made this phenomenal game in Fallout 3, and it really didn't become a hit until it made it to console when it was ported a little bit later after the PC game came out. And people really took off with it, and that's kind of what led them into buying Skyrim, along with New Vegas, because you also had New Vegas that happened before Skyrim as well. So you have all these games, and that, that's sort of the general history of why you now have Fallout 4. But I am really surprised, personally, that the Fallout 4 is getting the media coverage and sort of the attention uh, of, like, a, a big um, hit for the, the holiday, like Call of Duty or Halo is. I mean, a lot of people are buying, and a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, Sean was bringing up, uh, just before the show started, that viewership on Twitch is huge. And I, I just want your guys' opinion. Like, w- what do you think is making uh, Fallout such a big deal now, Uh based on what you know about the game before I mention a little bit about the story. Alan? I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, like, I'm not, you know, I'm a gamer, but not as hardcore as you guys, to be honest with you, in terms of, like, the gaming network. You know, I don't watch Twitch. I don't watch any of these things. You know, I'm, I'm a casual gamer. You know, I pick up a game, I try it out, and that's it. Um, I think it's honestly because the... Um, the claim of the fir- of the third one, right? The third one was really, really good, I believe. So I feel like, you know, word of mouth went with that, and obviously, you know, because of that, that's why, you know, people were hyped up for the fourth one. So I think that's one of the, re- I think that's one of the con- major contributing factors to why four is getting that much uh, coverage. Because I remember, I think, they were, sh- I, th- I forgot, Bethesda, was it E3? When Bethesda was showing off their, uh, they had their live stream showing off their, their stuff, I think, uh, they did a good job in terms of like you know showing off Fallout th- Fallout 4, and that really got a lot of people excited to to want to buy the game. What do you think, Sean? I think it's about the premise of the game. Like you said, it's a first-person shooter RPG, which is actually a really difficult thing to achieve in a in a good way. And they did a great job with Fallout 3. Uh, and you see so many other uh, genres trying to do that. Uh, Destiny, they're trying to make a first-person you know shooter MMO. And, you know, they had, you know, pretty good success with that as well. Uh, for me, the appeal of the, the story doesn't really do a whole lot for me. You know, the whole nuclear fallout aspect of it, eh, doesn't do much. Like, the whole zombie thing, I don't care too much for the whole apocalyptic, you know, post-apocalyptic, you know, 
you know, genres. Uh, but outside of that, I, I think they're really primed uh, to have a really good foothold on that market going forward with FPS infused with insert genre here. I think they're going to be able to, uh, you know, have a leg up on other people. So with Fallout 4 coming out and you have this massive group following, I think it's a lot of, uh, uh, like, a heavy fan base from before. Kind of like, you know, how you love Starcraft's uh, Star Wars so much. You've been waiting for that next, you know, title to come out. And Bethesda has been doing such a good job with their recent releases that this is just the next game that came out for them. There's so much hype. Just the fact that the, the company releasing a new game is enough to drive sales and viewership. So, you no, know, I still won't play the game, but I can understand why it's getting so much attention right now. Mm-hmm. So uh, a big part of why people might be interested in this is also stylistic choices that they make in the game. I mean, it's a very unique feel to the way the game and universe looks, uh, that sort of wasteland appeal. Uh, also, that you also have a 50s or 40s sort of infusion of that sort of stylistic uh, interpretation on vehicles and things like that, as well as the way characters uh, act and talk. Uh, I, I think those are big parts of what a lot of the draw in terms of the story is. I'm kind of curious myself uh, why uh, people are so interested, especially watching on Twitch, which is something that people do for a lot of competitive stuff, uh, wh- why people are so interested in watching something that's non-competitive. This is just, uh, you know, it's meant to be a game that's very personal because it's all about your choices and about what you want to do with your character. Uh, it, it, it's curious to me that, you know, it's taking up a lot of viewership on Twitch right now. Uh, but it, in, in terms of the gameplay, in, in my opinion, uh, I, I think it's phenomenal that they decided to, to merge the sort of FPS uh, RPG genre, since you already did it with you know Morrowind and Oblivion way back when for uh, sort of the standard top-down RPG. So it, it kind of made sense to me that they moved in this direction and, and tried to appeal more to the masses that were already playing FPS games. I, I have not played it yet, so I have to make that point. I purchased it and I have not played it yet. It's installed. I'm going to get to it <laughs> uh, probably sometime this week at, at some point. But it's going to suck me in for a long time. This is another RPG game that just eats up way too much of my time. But Steve, Battlefront's coming out next week. <laughs> and, yeah, we also have that. <laughs> you know, an interesting point on the whole uh, why you have so much viewership on a game that's really a personable uh, like a one-on-one, you know, you're shaping this little universe that you're in with Fallout 4 with your unique decisions to change the gameplay. Yeah, well, yeah. why would anyone want to watch me decorate my house in a game? It's interesting you say that because all the people... Like Minecraft? <laughs> all the people that are watching StarCraft right now, they're all watching people doing the campaign. I had to dig through different, you know, pages of people to find people actually doing competitive streaming. They're all interested in the story, and I think that harks back to why Activision Blizzard's even getting into the movie thing, because there's a lot of people that like to just spectate. They like to watch. You have all these people that are into sports and that we've grown up with it, watching you know, baseball, football, soccer, you know, massive markets, and now you have these kids growing up that would rather watch people play video games. And this is just the next thing that's coming out. People just like to be spectators. They enjoy the content, but they don't want to do it themselves. They'd rather just watch someone else do it. So you have these people. There's a there's yeah, a you're right. I do like to watch people do it. There's a, there's this guy with thirty thousand viewers donating him, just enjoying his his character and and the way he presents himself and the decisions that he makes is entertaining. And couple that with their he's playing the video game that they enjoy. So it's just great entertainment. And uh, you know that's I think that's really you know the future of you know the the way that the markets are going to be shaped with the youth. Speaking um, of great entertainment. Uh, I think uh, and I hope that this was great entertainment for anyone who was watching. I'm sure entertained myself. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I want to thank Alan for being my co-host uh, for this show. Alan, any last words? Uh, are we still doing this next week? <laughs> uh, I mean, I see no reason why not to continue. Well, we'll talk about this on the next show. It'll be a, a point for, for next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sean, I want to thanks, thank you for dealing with our technical difficulties that we are having earlier, and thank you for being on to talk. I, hopefully you'll come back. Uh, did you enjoy yourself? It was a lot of fun, yeah. I had to warm up to the whole concept, but yeah, I'm into it. I like this. It was a lot of fun. Appreciate you for having me. Anytime. All right, Alan, you're making some funny faces over there. 
<laughs> I want to go back and play Legacy of the Void. I'm right. only like four missions away from beating the game, okay? Sorry, guys. I want to know what happens. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Again, you're watching Jersey Hobby Hour. Uh, you can catch us next week, uh, Wednesday at 8 p.m., as long as we don't have any technical difficulties. Please leave some comments below. Check out the video description for links to all the stuff we were talking about. Uh, you can click those and head on over to other websites. Uh, but before you do, please like, subscribe, and share this video. Hopefully some of our friends will check this out. Uh, we're not planning to be you know, <laughs> YouTube stars anytime soon, but uh, we want all our friends At to get all. involved in the conversation <laughs> and uh, join the show like Sean has tonight. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next week.